Good, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, first uh, online session from the Natural History section of the Leicester Literary and Philosophical Society. We're very pleased to have with us this evening John Clarkson, um, who is Head of Conservation for Leicestershire and Rutland uh, Wildlife Trust. So, John, if I can hand over to you now, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Um, thank you very much. and. Uh... Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for for being here this evening. I know I've met uh, quite a few of you, and and uh, I'm guessing there are quite a few that I haven't met. And I really look forward to to meeting with you at some stage over the next you know, kind of uh, year, a few years, um, and uh, looking forward to a brighter future for wildlife over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, what I, what I'm going to cover. Um, this evening, I don't know how many of you listened in to my talk to the trust membership more widely last week. Um, I'm going to cover some more, some more ecological, more philosophical aspects of what we can look forward to um, in 2030, over the next 10 years, um, what sort of things we might hope for um, from uh, the, the landscape, the wildlife landscape of Leicestershire and, um, and Leicester and Rutland too, as part of the work of the Wildlife Trust. Um, and, and I really want to put some, some challenges to you um, as well and, and get some ideas from, from yourselves about particularly what you think is important. Um, what do you think we should be leaving uh, as a legacy over the next 10 years um, and, and thereafter um, for the, the, the biodiversity that we, that we share this planet with. Um, and um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, I know some of you will have seen this story and I wanted to, I was going to start with this, I, with all of my lectures, I usually try to start um, with uh, something that was in the news and, and, and this caught my eye uh, yesterday, I think it was in the Daily Mail with a typical Daily Mail slant on it. Um, I, when I was reading it, I don't know whether any of you have seen the Daily Mail version, but kind of two thirds of the way through, you got the, the, the impression that there were killer spiders out there that were sort of jumping at people's throats um, and really trying to kind of take over the world. Um, but it was a, a really, it is a really interesting article, which is underpinned by science. Uh, I think it was, at the, was at the Natural History Museum or the National Biodiversity Network, I can't remember which. Um, having undertaken some research in citizen science, uh, looking at the records of spiders that have been submitted um, and finding that Leicester is the spider capital of the United Kingdom, home to more species of, of spiders than anywhere else in the UK, well arachnids. Um, it was quite interesting too that in the Daily Mail they had uh, a harvestman I think in the, 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 the list of pho photographs um, sort of listing, listing the spiders. Um, but nonetheless, so there was an, there's an important aspect here uh, in terms of in terms of biodiversity. Obviously, you know, I'm sure we've all seen uh, the, the kind of uh, cave spiders moving into into houses, um, or daddy long leg spiders, as some people call them, um, and you know, kind of recognizing the changes that are occurring over the last 10 to 15 years uh, as a result of things like climate change. Uh, and it got me thinking also about something called syn uh, synanthropic species um, and whether or not we as a uh, we as an organism human beings and uh, have to we've got two choices in the future i guess um, there's a new there's a there's a school called new conservation and a school called old conservation um, and the the new conservationists are, are working on the premise that the future of the planet is one that in many respects is about organisms that uh, can learn to live with us uh, rather than us living with those with other species and there's, there's a really important question here about um, you know what is our relationship with biodiversity uh, and i think over the next i've seen a lot of change in in people's perspectives over the last 10 years, 15 years, uh, and I wonder whether or not there'll be an increasing shift uh, in thinking about what biodiversity is and what it means to us. So I, I, want, I want to kind of challenge you on that um, uh, as, as we go through, because it, it, it does, I suppose, crystallize uh, uh, the choices that we have in front of us. And I wanted to start, mindful that this is a 185-year-old, very um, erudite organisation full of erudite members 
Um, the name literary and philosophical society suggests that uh, I, I can't pull the wool over anybody's eyes. Um, that uh, our starting point obviously has to be that, 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 that we're all sharing this fantastic, amazing rock hurtling through the universe. Um, doesn't matter whether you think it's flat or round. The fact of the matter is that, <laughs> um, that, that we only have this one Earth that we know of that supports life and that everything that, that is on this planet is, is limited to that planet uh, currently, with the exception of human beings. Um, and, and that we're traveling through space at 67,000 miles an hour. And then we have to ask this question about what, it, what is, what is the, the biodiversity that we share this planet with? Are they partners on this journey through space and time? Um, are they providers for us? Clearly, we get a lot of resources out of them. We get food, we get fiber, we get enjoyment. Um, are they there for our, you know, our enjoyment and our food and do we have dominion over that um, or are they indeed you know just simple passengers um, and that we should take a completely different perspective on how we respect the biodiversity that, that occurs on this planet um, and that that you know, if you drill down on that one then you start to ask questions about kind of vaccination and the right to life of uh, viruses and bacteria um, and simple thing thing I always used to challenge students with was uh, if, you, if we are keen to give animals uh, rights, uh, especially those that show some degree of sentience, um, well, if we're all just genetic, all just bags of genes in some way, shape, or form, um, surely then plants should have the same sorts of rights to life, um, and and so on and so on and so on. Simply because you know they're occupying a space just in the same way as we are. So there, there's there's a starting point which I think is really really important because it, it also cuts into why we're a conservation organization and, and what, is, what is our purpose as a conservation organization. Um, and I'm guessing that it's really uh, to look after the passengers. Um, to me, the partners are things like um, you know, dogs and budgies and things like that. Um, whereas we're all, uh, we're all passengers on this, on this same rock. So that's the, the starting point of the, the philosophical journey. Um, and the, if we kind of drill down into a Leicestershire and Rutland perspective, I, I, want, I want to, uh, in terms of thinking about our future, uh, the future landscape of Leicestershire and Rutland, I, I want us to remember that biodiversity is everything really, uh, in terms of gene genetic biodiversity, in terms of species biodiversity, in terms of, um, well, ecosystems really, rather than habitats. And I know I've put uh, some three different sorts of habitats here um, but the fact is that what we've got in Leicestershire is haven't we we've got an we've got a fantastic um, variation uh, certainly in terms of the underlying the, the influence of the underlying geology uh, creating this uh, enormous mosaic of, uh, of different habitats um, different communities uh, and uh, that then, you know, kind of the, the, the whole raft of different species that, that we find across this landscape. And it, uh, it always amazes me how, uh, you know, pe people aren't simply aware of uh, just looking at the, the different types of grassland in Leicestershire and Rutland. They, they kind of people look at, at, look at grasses and, and, and it's just a green organism and they don't see variation. Um, and yet, of course, you know, we know that uh, we, we, we've got this uh, fantastic calcareous uh, grassland uh, landscape in the east. Um, and then we've got uh, relics of acid and mesotrophic grassland uh, across the rest of the county. Uh, and that's really important to, to, as, as part of this process of understanding what biodiversity is and how these organisms have, uh, have come to come to be in the, in the location that they are. Because one of the questions I want to, to pose um, in your mind is um, just what, what do we think should be the, the, the landscape of, of Leicestershire and Rutland in the future? Is it one that should be uh, cognizant of that variation or is it one that uh, I get a lot of uh, interesting discussions with different communities about this is possibly one of the most productive landscapes in, in the United Kingdom uh, from a farming perspective. Um, from a minerals perspective, for example, um, one of the top three counties for provision of minerals. 
Um, and if we look at Leicestershire and Rutland as being an engine room of uh, a variety of economies, um, natural economies and physical economies in the United Kingdom, uh, it's going to pose a lot of pressures and a lot of questions upon us uh, as to what, what the future should be uh, for, for Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, you know, if we're going to be building houses, we need the rocks. If we're going to be building roads and railways, we're going to need the granite um, and, uh, and limestones. Um, if we're going to be fighting climate change, um, then maybe we need to be planting lots and lots and lots of trees. Um, and we already know the government is kind of committed to, what is it, something like 25,000 trees a year. Um, where are they all going to go? Um, and so this underlying variation is really, really important. Um, and, you know, you guys all know that, that this, this is a county which is rich with a variety of species too, you know, so whether it's orchid rich meadows, whether it's uh, water voles, um, whether it's uh, wax caps and agarics and other uh, fungi, uh, purple emperors, you know, you'll all have your own um, exciting and interesting uh, and preferred species uh, within the within the landscape of Leicestershire and Rutland to to really enjoy. Um, and there's a question here about uh, whether there are species miss missing, of course, um, and indeed whether these species are representative of Leicestershire and Rutland, um, and also whether we can get more of each of those into this landscape. Um, if we if we just simply look at numbers. Uh, let, let's take triple SIs as an example, the sites of special scientific interest, um, as a representative figure. Um, much of the rest of uh, lowland England, the landscape of each of those counties is probably has something of the order of 8% of the landscape is notified as a uh, site of special scientific interest. Um, in Leicestershire, it's only about 1.3%. Um, which is an indication of the paucity of space uh, that's rich in nature. So uh, it's quite probable that if we, if we use that as a proxy, we actually have uh, many, many fewer species and many, many fewer individuals of those species in Leicestershire and Rutland as a historic legacy of the, the kind of man-made impacts that are that have been going on you know for thousands of years so leicestershire is probably one of i guess one of the most uh, man-made counties uh, in england um and why is that important well you, you, will, you will know the story here about biodiversity and ecosystem services um and that uh, biodiversity is is the thing that keeps us alive and i'm going to pose you a question here um about what biodiversity you're using right now um i'm not, not going to you know kind of open it up for a discussion um but i, I want you to think about this because it, it is clearly very very important uh and it's it's a really critical question to us as nature conservationists um because as i say it's, it's too easy for us to think about protecting species because we like to see them. Um, and we've got to remember that they also provide us with critical goods and services, um, whether it's greenhouse gas regulation or uh, flood control, um, whether it's clean water, um, the aspect of uh, soil carbon, really, really important. You know, we talk about uh, carbon sequestration through trees, um, but carbon sequestration in the soils is possibly just as important. Um, and whilst you're sitting there, you're probably using biodiversity in a right, wide variety of ways, or indeed biodiversity is probably using you. You know, we couldn't exist without the gut biota that broke down cellulose um, and, uh, and various other chemicals. Um, we've all probably got uh, fungi in the folds of our skin. Um, you know, we've probably got uh, uh, mites living within the hair follicles. Um, you know, so as an organism, we are an island of biodiversity uh, and we couldn't exist without it. Uh, and I bet you're all touching 400 million old year old biodiversity in some way, shape or form. Uh, so whether it's the plastic on your uh, computer um, or uh, you know, kind of sitting on a plastic chair or whatever. Um, and you've probably got some dead biodiversity uh, around you in terms of leather, in terms of the chairs, in terms of the tables, all that sort of stuff. Uh, who knows, you've probably been eating, eating biodiversity for dinner. So, you know, kind of we have to remember that that's a really critical thing, um, that, that we are an integral part of biodiversity, biodiversity is a part of us. Um, and one of the challenges we face over the next 10 years 
is to identify which of these goods and services are the most important to us. Um, because that's going to set the, the, the scene for where, I guess, um, isn't it, the, the species that we love, um, where, what space can be left for those, um, especially if we're so focused on planting trees, you know, in terms of addressing climate change. Where's the space for the grasslands? Where's the space for the wetlands uh, and things like that? Um, so it's a really important question that, uh, and I'll touch on this again later because it, it is, it's something that's superficially addressed, and it's something that we've got to got to get to grips with uh, an awful lot uh, more carefully, I think, uh, in the future. Now you're all, again, you're all familiar with this sort of story, uh, and again, I apologise. This this is scene setting, but it's important nonetheless um, because. What we, what I don't think people realise is that we've probably only really got about 10 years uh, to make a difference. Um, and, and by that I mean in terms of changing the trajectory, uh, the trajectory of travel that we're on at the moment, uh, in terms of destruction of the planet or our appropriation of the resources uh, of this planet. And if you're not familiar with this, I encourage you to have a look at something called uh, the Great Acceleration. So there's a, a fab website. Um, through which you can find on a website called the Anthropocene um, and there's a concept called the Great Acceleration which just charts things like the number of McDonald's which have existed since 1950 and how much nitrogen we use etc etc um, and just a couple of weeks ago there was uh, WWF and the Living Footprint Organization and the Zoological Society for London released a report called the Living Planet report 2020 you can see the top right hand corner there i encourage you to, to have a look at that um, because it came out at the same time as the united nations environment program released uh the global environmental outlook five or was it global environmental biodiversity outlook i can't remember uh we'll we'll see in a moment um but both reports basically said that since 1970 average wildlife populations have declined by two-thirds um and, and you know we can we can obviously have lots of discussions about the nuances of that um is it the number of mammals is it the number of species is it the amount of biomass there are lots of different uh, studies all of which come up with a fairly similar figure for set for quite different um aspects of biodiversity biomass numbers species um but they're all pretty scary over 40 50 years we, you know to to a large extent we're seeing kind of two-thirds decline 75 percent decline 25 percent decline doesn't really matter it's all the same thing um and i don't want to i don't obviously want to be negative about this um, it's just a reality uh, that's the kind of um impact that we've had on the planet and the map that you can see here comes from some research that was done in 2015 and apologies for those who can't see it um, it's a map of the world um, with based on a, a, a computer program called predicts and the, the the idea of this program was to to look at all of the data that uh, that is available in a metadata kind of way um, and to look at the trends of loss and change and to come up with plans uh, to give an indication of what the planet might look like at the end of this century. Um, and on a, uh, a business as usual scenario, um, we're looking at uh, much of the planet is, uh, is in red um, and magenta with uh, 25 to 30 or even greater than 30% continued loss of local species richness on a business as usual uh, framework. So <clears throat> we've, you know, that that's the current trajectory, the trend, um, and we've got to do something about that, haven't we? If we're to find space for nature uh, and to to keep those species um, that uh, that we that, that we so like uh, and so love, um, even in. Even in Britain, we see those sorts of numbers. Uh, I looked at the National Dormouse Monitoring Programme report a couple of days ago, showing that Dormouse numbers have declined, what was it, something like 55% um, in the, the last decade or two, uh, or three, I can't remember the, the period, but it's not uh, over a very long period. There's been a significant decline in Dormice, uh, as an example. So that poses lots of questions about how should we choose which of those species to save uh, in this journey, because the underlying mantra is that we uh, that, I, that I subscribe to 
is uh, finding safe, navigating a safe passage for the species that are here and that we want in the future. Um, you know, and we can either do it in a, in a predictive and a provide kind of way, um, and to make sure that we are pre prescriptive about those species that we want in 2030, 2040, 2050, um, or we can take an alternative approach, which is to leave it to chance uh, and leave it to nature indeed. Um, and you know, this is where partly where the rewilding concept comes in. Let's let nature take its course and nature decide. Um, but you can see here some of the, the, the kind of choices that we make about whether we should be looking at those which are at risk of extinction, or maybe they're vulnerable, or they're, they're suffering from rapid rates of loss, um, or whether indeed what we should do is make sure that we retain 10% of everything. Um, should we retain anything that's taxonomically distinctive? Um, you know, we already, you know, we kind of suspect that pandas are already a, a goner on this planet. Um, you know, there are probably plenty of other species, taxonomically distinct species, which actually probably have no relevance. And that's a really important word. They possibly have no relevance uh, on this planet in the future in an ecological context. Nature is full of species which have adapted and evolved and then have been ousted through natural processes. <clears throat> so there's an important question there about whether we should uh, we should be determining what the, the future should be. And then that this final bit about whether we should actually be saving species which are a benefit to humans um, and making sure that what we do is we ensure the natural environment is one that enables us to keep alive, um, you know, with oxygen and food and stuff like that. Um, and you might have noticed in and this really, I think, really, really exciting time that, that, that has appeared um, in this last couple of weeks, I suppose the last three months in preparation for next year now, uh, the global gathering of world leaders, uh, or indeed rather governments, because uh, it was a gathering of world leaders in New York last week. Um, but all the governments will be getting together in Kunming in China next year to reassess the Convention on Biological Diversity and to set targets for 2030 on the basis that in 2010, in a town in, called Aichi in Japan, they set targets for 2020. And uh, the report last, uh, last week or the week before, um, allied to the Global Biodiversity Outlook 5 report, was that uh, the world has failed to meet any of the 20 targets that they set in 2010. They set some ambitious targets, they set some realistic targets, and there were only 20 of them. Uh, and as, an, as, a, as a world, we've failed to meet any of them. Um, the United Kingdom report suggests that we've maybe met uh, half a dozen um, out of the 20. Um, and uh, the RSPB counter that and say that we haven't. Um, and we've badly missed some of the others. And what came from that is that the world leaders have pledged to halt Earth's destruction um, ahead of last week's uh, United Nations summit. Um, and you hopefully notice that Boris Johnson promised to protect 30% of the UK's land by 2030. Um, the, uh, the unfortunate bit in, in many respects, of course, is that they've, uh, they've tapped into the notion that national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty plus triple SIs uh, if you add all that up, it amounts to 26%. Um, so jobs are good and they've only got to fill in the extra 4% in some way, shape or form, uh, and they can tick that target off. Um, but nonetheless, um, what we've got is this fantastic opportunity now where governments are scrambling, just like they did in United Kingdom elections, to kind of outdo themselves with, oh, we'll plant 10 million trees, we'll plant a, we'll plant a billion trees and all that sort of stuff. And governments now are kind of competing with themselves to say we're going to be the greenest, most meanest, um, most wildlife friendly nation uh, by 2030. And that's something we can tap into. And that to me is the cheery future uh, that we need to uh, that we need to build on. So why 30 percent? 30 percent is a really important number uh, for for two reasons. Um, uh, Edward Wilson, kind of the god of biodiversity, uh, he's been starting a movement called Half Earth. And I hope you, if you haven't done, I encourage you to read the book called Half Earth because it's a cracking read. Um, and uh, here's a chart which kind of comes from that, which suggests that if we, if we were to save 25% of the habitats uh, within a landscape, um, then that would save approximately 71% of the species within that landscape for, in an island biogeography way. The bigger the island, the more the species you have, the more individuals you have within the, that, that island. If we could reach 50%, 
of the landscape, then we would actually save 84% of the species. But we're already in a law of diminishing returns. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a critical point here at around about 25 to 30%, where in terms of effort, um, you know, we, we're getting maximum optimum gain, I guess, for the book spend. Um, and so that, that's a really important number to think about. And if we look at it in, um, in a mathematical sense too, uh, then using, using kind of random number modeling, um, there's, 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 a, there's a suggestion that at 30% cover, if you were to add small patches and go to 31% and 32% and so on and so on and so on, um, by the time you get to 30%, you actually have started to create big enough patches within the landscape for organisms uh, to, to effectively be in their islands um, with stepping stones and corridors and things like that. So you don't really need to, uh, whilst it's ideal and it'd be great to have more than 30%, at 30% you can begin to think that actually you've got the basic building blocks of a, an ecologically functioning network um, within which uh, organisms can survive. Now, the critical thing here is that you need then to enable the species to be able to move through the non-habitat patches, uh, what we call the matrix, uh, the surrounding matrix. And, and that's something that we need to, to look at and, and address. Um, and just last year, I think, there was a, a, another report um, which was really interesting, which picked up on this 30%. And it suggested that if we protected 30%, then it would actually bolster the economy. Um, you know, you've all heard the talk that uh, a, a, an environmental prospectus actually is likely to cost the economy. Um, and there's something called the Das Gupta Review, which is being undertaken at the moment um, for the United Kingdom, but it'll be of global importance, which is aimed at um, identifying the economic value of the environment. And it's going to be a really, really powerful document. Um, and this research was done by a, a number of the world's uh, leading ecologists. So it wasn't just economists, but it was also ecologists. And what they found was that the benefits of protecting at least 30% of the world's land and oceans outweigh the costs by a ratio of at least five to one. Uh, and that's a message that we need to take forward, um, because that's about creating space for nature, as well as getting the goods out of nature. Um, and for me, the really interesting thing was, and I, 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 I like to use these comparative numbers, um, the amount of money that would need to be spent on an annual basis actually is less than that which the world currently spends on video games. Okay, and that's a really important thing to bear in mind that uh, you know, we kind of fritter away uh, money in ways which keep us happy. Um, but if we simply re-diverted, uh, or no, if we diverted that money in much more um, cost-effective manners, then for a small diversion, we can actually achieve an awful lot of security for ourselves and other organisms. Which then brings us to this fun a fundamental question of what is biodiversity for? And I apologize, there are lots of lots of words on this screen, and I don't want you don't need to look at all of them. Um, what I do with the master, what I used to do with the master students was to explore three different domains: a human domain, an ethical domain, and a biological domain. Um, and whether or not biodiversity should be uh, what I call instrumental, um, human-based, so for the economy, for social and enjoyment, uh, for recreation and for research, you know, th those sorts of values are, um, that, that are human centric. And perhaps the future of biodiversity conservation is about human beings, however much we might not want it to be. There's an ethical perspective, of course, um, you know, being precautionary, we don't have a right to, to remove these organisms, but there are also some really powerful ones about culture and religion. And I think we underplay at a global level, particularly the, the, the cultural and religious aspects. Um, and uh, perhaps not so important in a less year context, um, but uh, I, I suspect it could well be a very important one. Uh, and then obviously there's the, the natural aspect, things like um, ecological processes, predator-prey dynamics, enabling those things to occur. Um, and so th there's this fundamental question, should we be saving biodiversity for its very intrinsic value um, and allowing predators to, to chase prey across the landscape in the same way as people go hunting and shooting and fishing? Or should we be protecting biodiversity for, to keep us alive and to keep us on this planet? Um, and, and this then, and I know that the, the, the chart here is kind of a, 
quite a detailed chart, but I don't, you don't need to worry about the detail within this chart. This is a model that uh, Roy Haynes Young from Nottingham University, uh, kind of, he was one of the first people to come up with this idea of how might these ecosystem services differ uh, across the, the landscape uh, on a spectrum from natural to unnatural. So if we take a particular habitat, let's take woodland, for example, you know, we've got examples of natural woodland, well, not in Britain particularly, but uh, across the world. Um, and we've obviously got examples of urbanized uh, woodland. Um, and if we look at the different ecosystem services, so the kind of regulating services, things like climate change, water, that sort of thing. If we look at the cultural services in terms of spirituality, in terms of education, that's a different type of service. Um, if we look at the cultural services like recreation, that's a different service. If we look at the provisioning services like timber and food, they all peak at different points, potentially, across that spectrum. Um, and the really important thing here is that if we were to look at the landscape in terms of provisioning services, let's say maximizing the amount of timber, then it probably means a different landscape, a more urbanized, degraded landscape from a natural perspective than if we were to look at it in terms of maybe providing cultural and recreational services. And so it brings into this question of what do we want the environment to give us? Um, you know, because knowing what we want from that environment will determine what we get out of it and what is there. Um, we could obviously just simply go, well, actually, we're going to close ourselves in and create ourselves an entirely different landscape, an urban, a human landscape, and let the rest of the world survive. Uh, and Constantinus Doxiades, a uh, Greek architect uh, in, in the 1960s, calculated that a planet, the planet could support 20 billion people um, and only occupy 20% of the planet, and that 75% of the planet would receive no human footprint. Um, it's probably been discredited, but it was a really interesting school of thought, uh, and it was based on a school called Lichistics, um, the movement of human beings across the planet. And to me, that's a really exciting concept, that if actually there is a reality here that, I mean, obviously people wouldn't necessarily want to live in mega cities of, of uh, a billion people um it'd probably be a really horrible landscape to live in um but the fact that uh we could if we were much more efficient you know kind of find a way of creating space for nature and people um is something to hang on to not least because britain's not intact um and britain has suffered from this this trend of change um the map on the left hand side is a map of what we call intactness um, anything that's blue is regarded as being relatively ecologically intact, and there's very little there. Um, you'd probably argue, actually, that even the little bits that are there, Snowdonia, Brecon Beakers National Park, um, the, uh, the, the Muirlands below Edinburgh, um, and uh, the North York Moors, places like that, they're probably not intact, really. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you know, the United Kingdom as a whole is uh, is pretty degraded. Uh, we actually probably come something like 183 out of 196 countries uh, on the planet in terms of the league table of intactness. So the, the, the fundamental point here is that naturalness is probably irrelevant in the United Kingdom as a concept. Um, you know, we've already seen so much loss and degradation and fragmentation. You can see some charts here in terms of that across woodlands in Warwickshire um, and heathlands in Dorset. And you know, just how little remains um, in those landscapes uh, as a result of what human beings have done over the last 200, 300, 400, 2,000, 500,000 years, that sort of thing. You know, we know the story. Um, but that's important because remember the, the number 30%. OK, um, and the challenge there from an ecological perspective, regardless of species, if those species to have a place for, to exist, they need space. Um, and so we've got to create that space for them, that 30 percent. So I had a look at the last night. I had a look at the Leicestershire and Rutland uh, Biodiversity Action Plan 2016, 2026, looked at the rates of loss um, that were mentioned in that Biodiversity Action Plan. Uh, and we're looking at uh, the, the kind of the numbers you can see there. So Fenland habitats, 99.7% um, loss over a couple hundred years, wetland grazing, 
over 350 years, 81% loss, lowland bog, I don't know what the starting point was, 44% loss, species rich grasslands of all types, over 50 years, 97% loss, heath grassland, um, you can see 80% loss over nearly 200 years, ancient woodland, 11% uh, loss and 43% converted to plantation ancient woodland, so planting of conifers. Some of those figures are, are UK rather than Leicestershire, some of them are Leicestershire. Um, and the Leicestershire figures that I could get in terms of what remains, this is important, okay? 2,500 hectares of grassland, of species rich grassland, okay? Not grassland, or, but species rich grassland. And this is 2015, so obviously quite a lot probably been lost since then. Now, Leicestershire and Rutland covers 254,000 hectares. So only 1%. 1% of Leicestershire and Rutland is currently species rich grassland. Um, Heath grassland, 500 hectares, um, so that's 0.2%. Ancient woodland, 1800 hectares. Okay, so add that together and you're looking at you know, kind of 6%, 7%, 8% if you add the other habitats at most um, is species rich habitat in Leicestershire and Rutland, 8%. Okay. And we've got to get it to 30%. Well, we haven't got to, but uh, you know, a target is to get to it to get it to 30% by 2030. That's the magnitude of the challenge. Um, and you may hope hopefully you're aware of something called the Lawton Report, which came out 10 years ago, uh, which was a report to government, which suggested that we need to make space for nature by getting more of these spaces, by making them bigger, um, by making them better in quality and by making them more connected with stepping stones and corridors and things like that. And obviously, you know, as a wildlife trust, we're moving towards that. And you guys can obviously do stuff in terms of encouraging people to, to kind of to use that mantra, more bigger, better, uh, more connected. Um, and obviously remembering the surrounding matrix where we get sustainable use for those habitats. So just very quickly, I'm gonna give you a moment to think about this. Um, what do you think the 30% target should be? Um, you know, in terms of if we go back to how much was there, um, you know, kind of 150 years ago, should we say, um, how much do we need to 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 replace? Uh, to, how much do we need to to create to replace that which has been lost? Um, you know, so uh, in terms of species rich grassland, for example, I'm just going to give you three numbers which I, I calculated in terms of the replacement of the, the habitat that's been lost. So in terms of species rich grassland, we're looking at uh, creating, creating 22 and a half thousand hectares is probably the target we need to set. OK, 10 times as much as we have needs to be created in the next 10 years uh, if we're to meet that target, to give you an example. Um, heath, grass, heath and grassland, uh, only 50 percent of what we got. So 750 hectares is a reasonable target. Um, and in terms of ancient woodland, of course, you can't re recreate ancient woodland. That's why it's in italics. Um, but if we can get the existing 4,800 hectares into good condition, um, then, you know, that's that's uh, jobs are good in that sense. Um, and so we're looking at needing to create something like 76,000 hectares or have 76,000 hectares of land for biodiversity by 2030. Um, and mindful that all the nature reserves have an average size of 35 hectares, that means 2000 nature reserves um, uh, of that size as an average size. So there's a real challenge. You know, so I know the subtext of this, this, this presentation was beavers, boar and bison. Well, think about it. The average size of a nature reserve is 35 hectares, okay? How many boar, how many beavers, how many bison could you get as a sustainable population in 35 hectares? Yeah, kind of none really. Um, so we've got to be, you know, we've got to be really ambitious if we're to get those. Um, these are the maps out of the Biodiversity Action Plan uh, in terms of existing. I know the, the data is so tiny, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the point is that the, the, the spaces that are left are really, really tiny. There are lots of them, so there's hope. Um, and uh, and they generally there's a, there's a similarity uh, focus around the Charnwood landscapes northwest of Leicester, you know, kind of Bradgate Park and you know all that that sort of landscape there, um, in terms of woodlands, in terms of grasslands and heathlands, um, and you know, 
uh, across the rest of the county. And you're probably familiar with the Wildlife Trust's programme of living landscapes, identifying the, the, the different um, characteristic landscapes. Uh, and that's the critical thing, thing coming back to the, the, the variety that there is. Um, and so that this this is going to be. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm working with a number of partners now to to kind of reestablish a program to to get to get some movement here to start recreating uh, new patches and connecting patches. And there's some great stuff going on with private landowners to create private nature reserves and corridor clubs. Um, so there's some fantastic stuff going on already. Um, and if we can multiply that, then we've got a really important future. Um, so I'm going to leave you this question about whether we should look to reintroduce charismatic megafauna. I'll, I'll come back to it in a wee while, um, but hopefully I get you, uh, you get to see that actually there's a real challenge here about doing so. Um, and it's, uh, there's a, w a wide variety of reasons um, which we haven't got time to touch upon this evening, um, but I'd be happy, more than happy to do so later on. Um, not least, of course, you know, how scared the public would be by the idea of having uh, wild bison rampaging through the landscapes of the Charnwood Forest. Um, you know, you just imagine all the car, car accidents that would, uh, would occur with people who are not being kind of particularly careful um, as they drive through that landscape. Um, or indeed people worried about uh, uh, wild boar rummaging through their dustbins as they do in, in the Forest of Dean. Now, I think that's a question of human beings and changing our attitude to these organisms. Um, and that's part of the education story that we need to take people through. Um, so there are two aspects here, you know, obviously the habitat and the people. But I will come back to those because there, there are some elements that we might consider. Um, but there's also this mantra that if you build it, they will come. You know, and we know that from places like NEP, where storks have returned, um, as well as being introduced. Um, turtle doves have increased uh, and returned to NEP Castle. Uh, pine martins are uh, now being discovered in, uh, in the middle and northern Middle England um, and the Western Midlands. Who knows, they might well be in Charnwood Forest. I suspect they are. People probably just don't, haven't noticed them. Um, the red-eyed damselfly, which is a uh, small red-eyed damselfly, moving up through Britain as a result of climate change. Um, and, and cranes too, which have, have bred just outside of Spalding um, as a kind of a, you know, kind of the build it and they will come. So we don't need to reintroduce species. That's one of the really important things. They will come if we give them the space, uh, as long as they're mobile, of course, and they can move through this landscape. So I now, I now want to move on to the more challenging bit. And this is uh, uh, something that I want to put in front of you, because something that really, um, really struck me, my biology teacher, uh, Vernon Luckett, said to me when I was uh, uh, doing A-levels, he said it must have been really difficult for Charles Darwin um, uh, towards the end of his life because he couldn't enjoy the world um, for what it was. All he could see was uh, bags of genes. Now, I suspect he actually meant Gregor Mendel rather than Charles Darwin. Maybe I misremember what he said, but I thought it was a really interesting perspective. Um, and what I want to put in front of people is that maybe what we should do is we should look at the disturbances now and look at a world of disturbance, not a world of species. What we're missing is recognizing, as we are doing through climate change, that there is a wind, there is a fire, there are, there's rain, there's earth. Um, and these processes, these disturbances are critical determinants of actually the biodiversity that exists in various spaces. And we see that with climate change. The organisms are adapted to the disturbances that put pressure upon them in some way, shape or form. Maybe we shouldn't be worrying about managing species. Maybe what we should be focusing on is enabling disturbance. Um, things like the great, the, the um, <clears throat> the great storm of 19, what was it, 87, was a, you know, kind of was a salient lesson to us that uh, nature actually is a, is a, a very powerful force. Um, really interesting to discover that kites in Australia have captured uh, how to use fire. Um, so there's an organism naturally using fire now. They pick up sticks which are burning and fly them across the landscape to relocate fire. Um, and, you know, it's a natural, we know that's a natural process, it's, but it's one that we've removed from the landscape. And it's the, 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 the process which probably creates heathland, keeps heathland as a heathland. 
Um, you know, floodplains, the beavers are part of a floodplain landscape. Um, and rather than reintroducing beavers, what we should probably do is to reintroduce flooding um, within the floodplains to enable beavers to occur. They will, they will come across the landscape naturally, I'm sure anyway, over the next 20 years um, because of all the reintroductions that are occurring. And of course, then I come to the bison um, and the important work that Franz Vera was doing and showing how the landscape may be one that's created by the movement of large herbivores across the landscape. Um, and it, you know, maybe what we need to do is to, is to think about allowing these big herbivores just to naturally move across the landscape. Imagine if we could allow bison to move from uh, the Lake District National Park um, down to um, the South Downs, for example, to follow the vegetation as they follow the vegetation naturally. Um, you know, moving across Britain, uh, I think that would be, you know, kind of fantastic. So we're not looking at an organism there, we're looking at a disturbance, the grazing, of the, the pattern of grazing. Um, and that to me is you know, kind of a really important thing. And that then gives me this final thing, I suppose, in terms of um, uh, the, the, the aspects of biodiversity. More, bigger, better, connected and messier. You know, we need to get people away from this idea that we need to manipulate and manage and prescribe a neat environment where we are reintroducing species um, for our benefits and our interests and our excitement um, and actually just let nature take its course uh, and to let, you know, just let go and let the world become messy and small patches and big patches and scrub and, you know, kind of nettles and tall grasses and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, in many respects, I suspect that will change us as human beings too. You know, it'll remove the, the constraints of the four walls that, that kind of constrain our psyche. Um, and who knows, it'll make us happier people. Uh, it'll make us people who are less stressed. Um, maybe it'll make us people that are uh, more in tune with nature. You know, we realize then that we are part of the, the seasonality, uh, the change from day to night, um, from summer to winter, um, from the season of mist and mellow, fr mellow fruitfulness that we're currently in. Um, we could go wild foraging for fungi and apples and blackberries and things like that um, and take advantage of, of nature's fruits uh, and resources rather than try and uh, you know, kind of domesticate the, d domesticate the earth out of them. Um, so uh, within that, the kind of the final, the final message I want to kind of put through as a, as a thing to think about is how do we rewild ourselves to become part of that, you know, as part of being part of the biodiversity of 2030. Um, <clears throat> it's not just about, uh, you know, kind of maybe reintroducing beavers, maybe, um, who knows, but actually reintroducing a wilder human being too. Um, where you know, eight, the, the, the recent research, which you can see came out a couple of days ago, 85% uh, of adults reported that being in nature makes them happy, this intrinsic connection. And so we can rewild ourselves in our gardens, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of reducing our personal impact on our gardens. We can also accept these synanthropes, the spiders and the other species that are moving into our houses um, and actually crawling across us, across us as we sleep at night in our comfy in our beds uh, and things like that um, as a kind of the, 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 the ending point of our starting point, if you like. Um, and really that's it, you know. Um, what it, I know I haven't been specific about rewilding Leicestershire and Rutland, but I didn't want to be. Um, what I wanted to be was to say that actually this is about a philosophy. Um, it's about um, this mantra, uh, the challenge that we face uh, of having to change the steer, steer a different course, change a very alarming trajectory. We can do it. We, we need to be ambitious. 30% is, a, is a, a very easy target to throw out. Um, once we start to realize the implications of it, it can seem scary and daunting. It's possible, it's feasible. Um, we need to be committed to doing it. We mustn't be diverted away by, um, you know, seemingly exciting things like uh, having bison in the woodlands of Charmwood, um, <clears throat> but who knows? You know, maybe a few bison will escape from Kent where they're being reintroduced. Who knows, like the sea eagles that were reintroduced into the Isle of Wight. We've seen them over Rutland water this summer. Um, <clears throat> you might find a few wild boar in your garden uh, by 2030, just naturally. 
uh, and that would be something to look forward to. So I hope that's given you an idea, you know, kind of some thoughts um, and some think pieces, uh, some challenges, you know, what part, what do we want Leicestershire and Rutland to look like? Because everybody will have a different perspective on that. Um, and the Wildlife Trusts have launched their campaign um, to kickstart nature's recovery. So we are committed as a trust to doing what we can to, to, to make that 30%. Um, because if we don't find that 30% space, then there won't be space for those species. Uh, there we go. I hope that's okay. And I wish you well. I know we all, I mean, I suppose the thing I'd meant to mention is we're all in this, aren't we? Every little helps uh, and we all need to do something. And I wish everybody, I want to be part of that journey with you. Thank you uh, very much, John. Um, it, it's, it's good to be challenged. Um, and, and, and you've certainly challenged us uh, this evening. I suspect that people's reactions to what you've said will depend on whether people are uh, glass half full or glass half empty individuals, because you can certainly see alternative uh, predictions and interpretations uh, of what you've shown us. But, but let's see how optimistic we are as a group. Um, so can I, can I invite questions or, or comments for John? Uh, there are several ways you can comment. Um, uh, if, um, you can comment in the uh, chat window uh, on Zoom. There is a, a raise your hand feature in the participants window. If you put your hand up, I'll get to you. Um, or uh, you can just shout. Um, but um, Nicola um, has a question. Um, Nicola, do you, want to, uh, do you want to put your question? Thank you very much, John. Um, one of the things I see is that there are opportunities now to influence things being done differently to stop the loss as well as to increase the, the, the diversity. Um, one of the examples is I, I totally understand the rationale for tree planting, but in I'm in Blaby near the city boundary and some of the housing schemes, they've tr planted trees in the more nature diverse areas of the adjacent, not ancient meadows, but grassland, which is completely, you know, <laughs> you're losing more species rich habitat, which, you know, a few decades ago was considered quite significant. Um, to, yes, we want to, carb we want carbon capture, but I think, and there's things like the, you know, obviously the development plans for the city and the county, the opportunities to look at the corridors and the connectivity to be, to be really meaningful. And I think that's somewhere where with the wildlife, just maybe we have more of a voice. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Nicola. And I mean, it, it's, it's another one. I, I know I'm kind of hostage to the, throw it throw away comments the, the curse of good intentions um and 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 the real challenge there is that we obviously want to encourage people to 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 do things because it's important that they had to you know that they've at least attempted to do something um and and obviously the the message there is that we also need to to, to help people to understand that they need to look at what what are the implications of the choices that they make? You know, so what what is the what is there already? We need to make sure that people know what's there already and and value that and understand it. Um, and it, yeah, as you say, one of the things that um, I've been doing is uh, working with the county council to come up with a training program for parish councils, for example, um, with uh, their biodiversity duty. Um, we're trying to uh, help every parish council become more aware of the importance of biodiversity and through a cascading way um, to enable the parish councils to, I suppose, engage everybody within their parishes um, in a process of auditing their landscape, identifying what's there, working with recorders and experts like yourselves and interested people like yourselves to just to come up with that inventory and identifying the spaces that are you know, already important and making sure that we don't plant trees where they are. Because I'm ignorant, yeah. I don't know who decides <laughs> where the trees are planted that have to compensate for the significant hedgerows that are lost. I don't know who makes that decision in the planning process. 
Yeah, they're, 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 and this is part of the problem. These decisions are made in lots and lots of different ways in lots and lots of different p places. Um, and the challenge we have is to kind of find ways of making sure all of those decision makers actually know um, what they need to do, you know. So, um, and, and lots of them are good, of course, um, and lots of them just, you know, they're, 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 they're not necessarily aware that, that those choices have to be made. Um, and, you know, that, that part of the partnership that we're trying to establish is to, is to find how do we get to those decision makers. Um, so, Thank you. yeah. Thanks, Nicola. Um, we've got a question uh, in the chat window about um, road verges, uh, cutting uh, road verges. Uh, how do you persuade the council uh, not to cut the road verges at uh, inappropriate times? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, we, there's been some great stuff, hasn't there, and some bad stuff uh, in terms of verges. And uh, you know, I was having an email conversation with uh, uh, the Rutland Natural History Society this evening about the, the, the great stuff that they've been doing, you know, in terms of monitoring and protecting verges in, in Rutland. And, less to, and, and again, recent conversations with um, the county council about verges. And I don't know how many of you saw, uh, there was a press release, BBC East Midlands just last week about something called the Blue Hearts Project, um, putting up little blue heart signs on the verges to indicate to people that, um, you know, these verges are being deliberately left uh, to, to partly to go wild. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, that there are always going to be problems. We, we are working, you know, to try and uh, help the, the various local authorities to identify those verges that are still there, um, to come up with appropriate management regimes. There are problems, of course, in terms of things like, uh, you know, your, the ideal regime, I suppose, would be a cut and collect kind of thing, you know, typical hay meadow kind of approach where uh, the, the cuttings uh, and arisings are removed. Well, on a verge, you know, that in many respects, that's quite impractical currently. Um, not always, um, but that's a real challenge, of course. How do you get how do you get that hay removed from those verges? Um, and there's also, in my, my experience, I, I set up a verges project in Powys, um, was that actually often the major problem is with the contractors, not with the uh, with the, the highways authorities, that the contractors want to do a good job um, and that they go beyond the, the contract that's been let to them because they want to be given the money next year. Um, so they'll go back, you know, of their own volition and cut it again to make it look neat and tidy. So there's a whole raft of players here within it. And I'm not I'm not absolving anybody of the blame when things go wrong. Um, but it is a very, very complex and, you know, kind of challenging perspective. But, you know, I, I'm whilst, you know, I, I am. I'm not unaware of the problems. We we had some communication with one of the local authorities just two weeks ago about uh, a persistent uh, inappropriate management of a really really important verge, um, and you know they they said oh no it was the contractors and that, then they did some digging and they said no it wasn't we got it wrong we didn't have it you know we didn't sort it out ourselves, um, so there are still problems, but. My, my discussions with uh, you know, kind of the, the various people in the different local authorities in the last six months has been encouraging. Um, I'm seeing commitment from them. There's a, a really good guide from Plant Life uh, called the Good Verge Guide, um, which we've put in front of them. Um, and you know, they, they, they've, they've all welcomed that um, and they're just exploring different ways in which they can make that happen. Um, so yeah, you know, we're not, it's not a, pa there's no panacea here. We're not going to get them all managed appropriately yet. Um, who knows before long, um, you know, we not, might not be actually using cars on roads. And so the roadside verge cutting will be kind of irrelevant in that kind of way. Who knows? But yeah, you know, I think there's the, the, the there's a change here, um, that, uh, I'm, I'm quite positive about. There's a, um, a village in Rutland, and I think from memory, it's, it's Braunston in Rutland, uh, where there is a verge uh, where there are um, orchids. And um, each year, um, uh, stakes appear driven into the verge with laminated signs on them saying, don't cut this verge, there are orchids on it, wait until... Now, I, I may be wrong, uh, but I'm pretty sure that's an individual who goes out and, and, and puts some wooden stakes in and just says, just don't cut this bit. Um, speaking for yourself as an individual, John, not speaking on behalf of the Wildlife Trust, um, and, and, and for the glass half empty people among us, 
Um, where, where do you stand on guerrilla action? Because talking to councils is sometimes a, an unrewarding process. Yeah. What do you think yeah. about guerrilla action? Yeah, no, I completely agree. You know, I mean, it is it, it's, it's immensely frustrating. You know, you go to another meeting, you know, and 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 I know with 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 the staff in the conservation team, they say, oh, I've been banging on about this for 10 years now. And, it, you know, I'm just not getting, you know, I'm not getting the progress. And, and yet again, I get this email saying they've just trashed this verge. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I completely see that, which is why I say, you know, it's not it's not a story which is. Uh, which is completely positive, um, and and I, I certainly I'm, I'm a great advocate of, uh, of of that kind of approach where you actually take your um, with you know within reason without breaking the law and all that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> we have to defend nature, uh, and it, I, I don't have a problem whatsoever as an individual or indeed as an organisation with people who go out and stick those stakes up and say, look, you know, maybe you're not aware that this is something that's of importance, um, and don't do this. Um, you know, one, one of the things in terms of ethics I used to to, to put in front of the, the master's students in particular, um, because we had more time to talk about ethics, was that if you stand by and watch a crime, then you're complicit within it um you know and just discussing that as a concept um and and that puts the onus upon us as individuals to not stand by and watch things happen um and so yeah I'm, i i don't have a problem with uh, with us going out and saying look you know that somebody's done something wrong here um and uh, even indeed you know kind of taking some hay rattle seeds and spreading them around or something well actually i wouldn't advocate that um but you know what i mean well, we'll yeah. edit that bit out of the video. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, great guerrilla action within within reason is important. You know, uh, let's 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 scale that up in terms of things like HS two, um, and a, a long debate that I had um, when I was working as biodiversity policy officer for the National Trust. Um, uh, I was within a policy team, the, the, the kind of the national policy team, and one of the uh, and the only relevance of this is that this was a dis discussion at a policy level uh, in the national team was that um, part of the executive team were saying we have to respond to what the public wants, you know, because if the pub the public wants is what provides us with our subscriptions and our uh, our reason for being, and if the public wants this, then that's what we should be giving them. Um, and you know and, th and that's why they were saying well look actually the public want loos and brews and, and tees and views you know um and and i was saying well look actually what if the public doesn't know that it's got the wrong thing in mind who's going to tell the public that it's wrong um you know and so somebody's got to stand up for wildlife and tell people that they've got it wrong thank you um do we have any more questions or comments for john yes no? I think I should say something, Alan. It's Russell. <laughs> um, uh, brilliant, John, to hear you talking about uh, less less tidy, more messy. That's uh, that seems to be an easy solution, not a fighting, battling solution, but something which is just you know sit back and let it happen. But um, I am also concerned that. Um, my biodiversity in botany research tells me that the most biodiverse places in Leicestershire are within the city. They're in the urban setting. And I noticed that over the last hundred years, about a quarter of all the tetrads in Leicestershire have changed in human use, buildings have appeared where we are spreading. And so this route that you're suggesting uh, seems to me to be sort of battling against uh, an almost unstoppable force at the moment. Is there not a way of thinking in terms of encouraging our biodiversity within our urban setting? and appreciating it because it is quite something compared to what's going on in the agricultural areas. Yeah, thank you, Russell. That's a really interesting question and, and absolutely it opens up a whole Pandora's box of issues, doesn't it? Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, th th there's an aspect here about being messier in the urban environment. Um, 
and th there's there's also an underlying inference in your question, I suppose, about um, the the challenges that uh, of our choices that whatever we choose to do, whether it's to manage or unmanage, there will be intended and unintended consequences and within those consequences intended and unintended there will be species which are lost um, so there will be species which we lose because we choose not to manage there'll be species that we lose because we choose to manage um, and uh, one of the things that I, i've been doing over the last nine months is working with the university of leicester i don't know how many of you have seen uh, just just in the last three months they put out a questionnaire to people um, as part of a process of, um, well, they call it a mutualistic city. So I talked about synanthropic species. Um, and what, what we're looking at doing is setting up a, a project, if you like, called the Mutualistic City Project to identify, um, you know, just how biodiverse urban areas can be um, in a mutualistic way with human beings um, and helping people value that. So part of the questionnaire was uh, about, you know, kind of, are you are you comfortable with uh, with wildflowers? Are you comfortable with green spaces? Are you comfortable with um, landscapes in an urban area which are not managed, you know, as opposed to the manicured green spaces? So we wanted to find out, you know, what what do people? Uh, there were a thousand and forty eight respondents uh, to that questionnaire, and and the data will be chugged through in the next three months. So there's an element here of finding out what people want. So we are, you know, there, we are focusing on the city too. Uh, and obviously, uh, Helen O'Brien, who's the uh, one of the two city ecologists, um, she's been writing the biodiversity action plan for the city. Um, and, uh, you know, within that biodiversity action plan, there's, there's clear focus on um, kind of wild spaces within that. Uh, because it's it's particularly important. So you know, th th there's a spectrum here, isn't there, between over management and under management, and and consequences and choices uh, within that. But uh, absolutely, we have to recognise that. Um, you know, coming back to my point about uh, uh, Doxiodis's idea of megalopolis, uh, or indeed ecumenopolis, was the the overriding model. Um, we need to look at a, a planet where um, people's living space is also a wild one. Uh, in some way, shape, or form. I know that doesn't necessarily, you know, answer some of the points that you were making, but I hope it gives some indication that, you know, that, that there's the urban areas are just as important as the rural areas, because after all, I mean, let, let's face it, you know, swifts have become an urban species. They're a cave dweller. Um, house martins, you know, more naturally uh, in the kind of rocky cliff face landscape. They're now an urban dweller. Um, you know, we could easily rattle off those species which have, have become, let's, so let's take house sparrows, um, you know, a whole raft of species which are uh, adapted to living in a human environment. Hedgehogs now don't live in a rural landscape. 75% um, decline over the last 10 years in the rural landscape. They're now pretty much restricted to villages and, and towns. Um, so yeah, there's a whole raft of species which will only exist in, in, in association with human beings. Uh, there's a comment from uh, Helen uh, in the chat window. I don't, I don't know if you're Helen as in uh, Helen O'Brien or if there's more than one Helen in Leicester. <laughs> uh, do, you want, do you want to say anything about your, your comment about management? It's program? Helen O'Brien. Helen, you're on mute. I don't know if Helen wants to be. Yeah, sorry. Hi, oh. everybody. Sorry. Um, and thank you, John. Excellent talk. Yeah, it is me, Helen O'Brien, uh, Leicester City Council. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the point raised by um, uh, Russell was, you know, about the urban biodiversity is, is very, obviously, very dear to my heart. That, um, we've got some fantastic places in Leicester and, and, and Russell has been around most of them and, and helped us to record stuff as, as have you, Alan. And um, I think it, it's important that in some cases they're actually undermanaged, uh, you know, for resource issues or because they're, um, you know, they're, they're almost like forgotten places. But, you know, examples like our Welford Road Cemetery, um, you know, quite undermanaged places, you know, parts of it are left to go wild. Um, some of our brownfield sites that, you know, are allowed to, you know, 
set seed for a few years, they become very species rich very, very quickly. And, and it's, it's a great example of how quickly our wildlife can adapt and, and move back into areas. And I think that's some of the messages that John was putting across, that if we give nature a chance to breathe, it will, it will actually survive. And, and I think that gives us all a bit of, of hope for the future. Um, and I think one of the things that I like about working in Leicester is the proximity that people get to nature. And I, I think it's a great message that we need to take forward to our future generations, which might sound a bit, oh God, here we go again. But it, you know, it is the younger generations that we need to look after and to make them more aware of nature and what better place than in our towns and cities in Leicestershire. You know, it's out there and, and people need to know it's on their doorstep. So I think, uh, you know, we, we've, we have our wildlife in Leicester and during lockdown, it was even more apparent when I, when, when I was able to go back out and look at some of those sites and just see how they flourished without being, you know, managed and some of the areas of grassland wasn't, wasn't cut so frequently. And, and again, it, it really increased in biodiversity. So I saw a snipe on Watermead Country Park where you would never see snipe because the dog walkers weren't around. So very, very quickly, things will recover if we mm. give them a chance. And if, if I can follow on from that, actually, just to come back to, to Alan's uh, quite quite rightly reiterating this, the point about um, giving hope to those who are glass half empty. Uh, the, the, the point about young people is really important because I, I think what I'm seeing uh, uh, is not only a change in the leadership, uh, and the perspective of the leadership, whether their words are empty or not, it doesn't matter. What I'm seeing is uh, more and more young people who are um, be being uh, wild. Um, and the very fact that what we've seen just this week was Maya Rose Craig is now a member of the RSPB Council. You know, who would have thought even 10 years ago that a 16 year old uh, young person could have the ear of the global leaders and tell them what it means um you know and and have them quaking in their boots over their choices um and I, i'm seeing a real shift in terms of people's awareness of the power of the need to engage uh the emerging environmental awareness um the, this this year spiritual awareness of of young people now you know that that they, they are realizing that, that they're inheriting their future uh, and they need a say in that future. And what I'm seeing from, from those young people is an environmental awareness, not university, of course, but it's like everything. Um, but I am seeing lots of people who want uh, an environment that, that is a good environment. And to me, that's, that's really empowering. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks very much. Um, so both looking at the clock uh, and also uh, being mindful that I think we, we we need to finish on a glass half full perspective. Um, I, I think at this point I'm going to hand over to the chairperson of the natural history section, Hazel Graves, for her concluding remarks for the evening. So Hazel, I hope your internet connection. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that, John. It's um, it's just been so amazingly thought provoking. Um, uh, I know amongst my personal group of friends who are in actual fact are mostly volunteers for the Trust, we do talk quite a lot about the problems um, that are facing the world and our constant talk is what can we as individuals do about it um i'm not sure if i'm you're telling me exactly what i can do about it other than what i'm doing at the moment most of us are out on the reserves volunteering um doing um uh surveys um, we've been listening to um, David Attenborough, who's telling us not to use plastic and, um, and telling us not to waste. So we're taking all of these things on board. But and I suppose by contributing to the trust, we are enabling people like yourselves 
to manage this for us. I mean, I understand that people are um, helping with verges and things like that. I think it's just so interesting. It's just such a big subject and it's the individual does sometimes struggle to know exactly what to do. But um, I shall listen to your talk again and I shall pick out bits more that I can do. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm sure lots and lots of us are all having the same thought. What can we do as individuals? And I think that's probably one of the best things you've left us with, actually, that we all do need to more, do more as individuals. Uh, just sitting back isn't any good. We've got to, we've got to help out. So thank you so much for that. You, I'm sure you've actually made us all think very, very much indeed.